Millet, um, <clears throat> I mean, the more you dig deeper into Millet, the more I think interesting it is, um, it, it becomes and is. Uh, it, I mean, what's unique about Millet, really, uh, certainly in modern political history, I can't think of anybody in the political map um, who has had such a deep understanding of economics, just straight up economics. So there is a, a just a just a, a, a one example is a video that's up on um, on on Twitter right now, um, and and it looks like there's a series of videos called Millet Explains. You can subscribe to this channel, I guess on Twitter X called Millet Explains, and it just showed videos. I mean, explaining different economic principles, and this one, for example, is about free trade, and he just talks about how free trade. Uh, is good, how Im import tariffs weaken the economy and make you poor and a bad, uh, on a, on a bad uh, economically. And he does it easily, fluidly, without hesitation, and j just simple economic reality. And, <clears throat> you know, you can tell he's, 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 he's trained. He's an economics professional. And he knows his stuff. Now, not all economic professionals know this stuff, but he is because he's trained in Austrian economics. He's, he's got it right. <clears throat> and um, he's president. Um, and there's no wonder, therefore, that uh, one of the first things he's doing as president is reducing barriers to trade. He's eliminating tariffs. He's reducing all kinds of taxes and, and whether tax or other barriers to the facilitation of international trade and good for him. This is going to be crucial uh, for Argentina, and indeed, to the extent that he is successful, it'll be to the extent that he turns Argentina into, if you will, kind of a free trade, I was going to say island, but that was my hope for the UK, free trade haven, uh, a zero tariff place in the world, in the middle of Latin America, and uh, investment will flow, goods, cheap goods will flow, which will raise the standard of living of Argentinians. And then uh, Argentinians will specialize and, and, and their agricultural goods, their wines. Maybe we'll see a shale revolution in, in Argentina where, where we'll start fracking then. Uh, natural gas will flow out and they'll start exporting all this other stuff. And whether other countries lower their tariffs or not, it doesn't matter. Argentina will be a massive beneficiary of that free trade. So um, of their zero tariffs. So the fact that they're not taxing their own citizens for buying stuff from outside the country. <clears throat> so uh, uh, that's amazing, and it's amazing to see him explaining it. it it's amazing, uh, particularly when you think about our leading candidate for president in the United States, uh, Donald Trump, who thinks trade is a lose-lose proposition. He thinks the United States loses when it trades with Canada, never mind China, but with Canada. Who, who has a, a, a five-year-old's understanding of international trade, like a, a, which is a zero-sum understanding of international trade. Or, or anybody, are there any other candidate? I'm picking up Trump because he may trade a big issue and has promised 10% tariffs across the board if he gets reelected. But all of them, not a single one of them out there, can literally, in concrete terms, actually explain why free trade, why lowering tariffs to zero, again, I want to make free trade real to you. Not fair trade, not okay, somewhat, maybe sometimes trade. I'm talking about free trade. Zero tariffs, unilaterally. Unilaterally. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, with the exception of uh, uh, those things that are unequivocally necessary for national defense. Um, Free trade unilaterally, he can act, he actually shows why it's good without any equivocation. And that's, there's just no politician I know of in the Western world who can actually do that or comes close or tries or who wants to do it. So he's not, you know, the, the leftist media likes to attack Millet as just another Trump or another Bolsonaro. He's nothing like Trump and he's nothing like Bolsonaro. He's actually intelligent, and he's actually knowledgeable, which is a, and, and actually as principles, principles. He has ideas. He knows what he wants. 
He has clear ideas. He is ideological, which is the exact opposite. The exact opposite. He's more different than Trump than Biden is different from Trump. Biden is Trump light, Trump left, Trump, but it's the same. No, no big difference. Uh, and and, and, and Millet is a, a complete break with the Trump, Biden, DeSantis, Haley, throw them all in there. Complete break with all of that. So anyway, as you can tell, I'm a fan. Uh, one of the proposals that he sent yesterday, uh, an elaboration of what he announced last week, was he actually sent Congress a list of 27, 27 companies that are currently in the hands of the state that he wants to privatize. Uh, that includes uh, the Port Administration, the airline, we'll get back to the airline in a minute, a couple of banks, the Mint. Um, uh, I think from this, it looks like the post office. Can you imagine privatizing the post office in America? God, I mean, such a, it's such low-hanging fruit, so obvious to do in America. They will never do it. Uh, construction companies, I guess, uh, all kinds of other stuff, navigation company, the railways, uh, a lot of railways. Uh, there's a bunch of railways here. Retirement insurance. So he wants to nationalize the retirement insurance program. That interesting. Um, amazing. Um, it turns out that with the exception of like seven of the 27 companies, every single one of these companies runs at a deficit. They're all losing money. So privatizing will make them more efficient. Whoever buys them, if they're willing to pay anything for them, uh, will commit to making them more efficient. It also means laying off thousands of people. Uh, these companies are unbelievably overstaffed and unproductive. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, a revolution. Uh, these are 27 large companies. I, I think that, yeah, there's some energy companies. Energia, uh, Argentina looks like a nuclear uh, electrical company. Uh, I mean, this is fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so hopefully uh, Congress will, will allow this and it'll get privatized and this will go through. And then finally, as part of uh, privatizing the uh, national airline, uh, the president also wants to do something bonkers, right? Completely crazy that doesn't exist in the United States. It's called open sky policy, which basically says any airline from anywhere in the world can fly any route within Argentina. That is, a Mexican airline can fly from Buenos Aires to, um, to uh, Bariloche. Or the, Mexican, the, 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 the Chilean airline can actually fly from Lima. Uh, no, Lima is Peru. What am I saying? Okay, so Peruvian airline can fly from Lima, uh, uh, you know, anywhere in um, Argentina. They don't have to connect through Buenos Aires. In other words, they can do what makes economic sense. Now think about that. That does not exist in the United States. British Airs, British Air, can fly from London to LA. But they can't fly from LA to Seattle. They can't fly from LA to New York unless it's part of a flight, I think, that continues to London. No, indeed, when Virgin wanted to start a domestic airline in the United States, it had to be 51% owned by, an Amer by Americans. It has to be a domestic airline in order to fly domestic routes, which made Virgin USA a lot less efficient than if it could have been part of the Virgin network and just be exactly the same ownership, run exactly the same way with exactly the same management and everything else as Virgin and therefore compete with American Airlines. I mean, imagine if European airlines, budget and otherwise, were flying routes within the United States. I mean, of course, American Airlines lobby for protection. They want fewer competitors. But that's the point. Get I mean, this is the point, and I'm sure whoever buys Argentinian airways from the government will lobby to prevent this in Argentina, but this is the point of having a principled president. I don't care. 
I don't care. Compete. Compete. Prices would drop. Quality would go up. A variety would increase. Uh, and some airlines would go out of business. Maybe quite a few of America's airlines would go out of business because they deserve to. And there would be real competition over routes, over fees, over, uh, I mean, prices, over quality, over every single dimension. Imagine if Europe did the same thing with the U.S., if it allowed American Airlines to fly between cities in Europe. I mean, you'd literally have a, a, a transportation revolution the likes that we haven't seen since airlines were deregulated in the 1970s. So this, this is huge for Argentina, good for them. You, you'll see massive competition. Right now, the two airlines that dominate South America, LATAM and, uh, LATAM and, uh, and uh, Avianca out of Colombia. And um, you could see other airlines, other uh, South American airlines, expanding their route system by taking advantage of flying into Argentina freely. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, Argentinian airlines might go to business, but who cares? And uh, you might even see some American airlines flying unusual routes into Latin America, given that they now have, will have the opportunity. But let, let's say, let's see if that happens. But if it does, I mean, uh, Tim says New York to LA in $50. I mean, in Europe, if you're willing to fly the discount airlines, you can sometimes fly for 10 bucks from London to, I don't know, to Italy. You can fly for, for really, really, really cheap. Now, service sucks and you can't take a suitcase and all that. But uh, and they start adding on if, if you add on stuff. But Europeans love it because it basically makes it possible for anybody to go anywhere in Europe. Students, uh, poor people, you know, they can travel anywhere. They just adjust in terms of what they take, how much they take, um, and, uh, and, and, and they can fly. So it's, that could happen in the United States where you could fly domestically for, um, you know, domestic prices, domestic airline prices are really expensive in the U.S. as compared to Europe. And the reason for that is they're protected. Now, there are also lots of taxes and costs and gate charges at the airports and all kinds of other stuff. So you'd have to increase capacity also in, in airports. But all that is doable, and you would have a, a revolution in air, in, in, in air flight. But yeah, you know, if, but if we actually got those really, really cheap airlines, call them, I don't know, the dollar airline, then, then as Jennifer points out, Taka would complain that it was demeaning for poor people to have to fly in the dollar airline, and uh, Taka Carson would be opposed and rally against it. And, and he'd point out that the dollar airplanes, I mean, because the cheaper airplanes would probably be uglier than the, uh, the Saks Fifth Avenue airplanes and, uh, and, and or oh, the business only airplanes. And he would complain. Uh, he would really complain about that. Um, all right. That's Millet. So far, so good with Millet. Uh, as I said, next Thursday, not tomorrow, but, uh, not today. But a week from today, uh, at 6 p.m. East Coast time, I'll be interviewing an Argentinian economist. He'll be speaking from Buenos Aires, and we'll be talking about Millet. We'll be talking about his policies. We'll be talking about what, what he's already done, what The Economist expects him to do. I Ivan will be explaining all this. He's a good guy. He's quite articulate, good English, and uh, it should be a fascinating show. So I hope you'll join us next Thursday, Your Book Show, uh, at 6 p.m. East Coast time.